Okay, well, we get going. Hi, everyone. And um, welcome to week three of our series on navigating the design to manufacture journey. I'm Abby Hurd from the Knowledge Transfer Network. I'm in the manufacturing team where I lead on helping innovators with physical products get from an idea to scaled up manufacture across a whole range of sectors. At KTN, we work with innovators to challenge ideas and thinking. We build collaborative networks to deliver results and we de are determined to help innovators move from an idea to a manufactured product. Moving ideas into production is a challenge that is often underestimated. Only a small proportion of physical products ever make it to scaled up production. So in previous weeks I've mentioned this, but I think it's worth being aware of the fact that it is hard and, and understanding a bit about why it's so difficult. So if you've got some realism about what you're getting into, then you can be better prepared for this journey. So three, three broad reasons why developing physical products is hard. It's harder than uh, just tech or software or services. Firstly, you've got extra dependency on third party relationships with contract manufacturers, designers, suppliers, distributors. There's a really diverse range of skills and knowledge required to do this. And thirdly, significant investment is needed up front. Things like tooling, materials, labour um, cost a lot of money. So in partnership with Design Product Design Scotland, we've set out to achieve two main things through this series. Firstly, to address the diverse range of skills and experience required. We'll provide insights from experts and experienced speakers and there'll be an opportunity to ask questions. Secondly, to help um, with the need for strong relationships and connections, we want to build a UK-wide community who have an interest in navigating or help other people navigate this design to manufacture journey. So each week we're focusing on a different challenge that from our experience we see recurring. This week we're looking at a topic that's really right at the crux of this series. We're looking at um, scale and manufacturing. So our three incredibly knowledgeable speakers this week will cover some different perspectives. We've got somebody looking at design, we've got an innovator and we've got a manufacturer. And although they've each got experience of the broader journey, Mick, who you'll meet in a minute, has brought lots of products to market He's going to talk from a design perspective. Adam, an innovator, also runs a design consultancy and has got um, experience developing new manufacturing processes. And John works with innovators through the whole journey, bringing ideas through design to manufacture. So very quickly before we get started, I'd like to introduce you to Meeting Mojo. So the networking part of what we're doing here is extremely important. So if you check the box for wanting to connect people, you should have been sent a link to Meeting Mojo. If not, don't worry, let me know and we'll get that sorted out. Obviously, you can't see the other delegates on this call at the moment, but there's lots of you out there with a wealth of experience and an equal amount of you with ideas who would really benefit from that experience. We'd love to help you um, connect to each other. So to see who else is here, to get in touch with them, um, you can use Meeting Mojo to do that. Um, and that's going to be open right through the series and we're hoping that the community will grow and evolve um, with time. So as we go through you can start to post your questions on the Q&A which you'll find at the bottom of the screen. We've got a total of 12 events planned in the series, this is number three of 12 and we'll be announcing the next four events at the end of today's session. But for now, I'm going to hand you over to my co-chair, Alistair McEnroy, the CEO from Technology Scotland, and Ali will introduce our speakers and run the Q&A panel session. Ali. Thanks, Abby, and, and, and afternoon, everyone. Just uh, quickly, if I could add my, my welcome to, to Abby's there, and, uh, and welcome so many of you onto the call, which is great. I've noticed we've just ticked over the 250 participants on the call, which is Fantastic. We're growing uh, week on week in this series, so we're, we're setting a high bar uh, today. Uh, my name is Ali McEnroy. I'm the Chief Exec at uh, Technology Scotland. We're an industry association for Scotland's enabling technology sector. Uh, and among other things, we are the home of Product Design Scotland, who are your co-hosts for today. I'm going to be your chair for this section uh, of the meeting, um, and I'll be facilitating the Q&A after we've heard from our three speakers. Now, we've got a audience as I mentioned on the call today, so that might be easier said than done in terms of the Q&A, but please 
don't let that uh, put you off submitting your questions at any time uh, during the presentations or after. Uh, could I ask you when you do so, if you could do that via the Q&A tab that you'll see at the bottom of your screen and not via the chat tab. Uh, questions submitted via the chat tab do tend to get lost uh, in the sheer volume of, of communications that come through there. So if you could put it through the Q&A tab, uh, I'd be much obliged. And also uh, related to that, if you could make it quite clear in your questions what one of our speakers uh, you are addressing your question to, that would help an awful lot as well. Given the expected number of questions we think we'll get, we will be doing uh, kind of one panelist per answer. So it makes it a lot easier for us to direct that um, to the right person. Right, okay, that's uh, enough of that. Straight on to our uh, guest speakers. And uh, first up, we have Mick Carroll from Blueprint Product Solutions. Uh, and Mick uh, is going to be really coming, I guess, from the designer perspective, talk about uh, how to plan, preempt, and mitigate risks. So I'm going to mute myself. So Mick, I'll pass over to you, and I believe Olivia will be sorting out your slides. And stuff. <clears throat> Hello, everybody. I'm just waiting for the slides to come up. Okay. Um, first slide then, please, Olivia. Right, my name is Mick Carroll and I'm Managing Director of Blueprint Product Solutions. Uh, we're a turnkey product development consultancy, providing everything from product invention and marketing through to boxed product ready for sale. Uh, not just product design, uh, and we've developed this service offering because uh, of the problems that our clients bring us. We've been in the business for 30 years now and probably have uh, seen every possible configuration and scale-up problem uh, that's come through our doors for consideration. I can't go through every possible scenario in this presentation, but I can try and inform you of the major issues that we need to have answered uh, to be enabled for you to, to make the right decision regarding production techniques and strategies before scaling up activities commence. Uh, I've also tailored this a little bit more towards the SME rather than the um, big PLC type of organisation. Uh, slide three, please. So the most basic thing that you have to understand is that the more uh, products you want to manufacture and the cheaper you want to buy that product, the more expensive the setup costs. Pretty basic knowledge, but you'd be surprised how many people do not appreciate this fact. Everybody wants the product to be as cheap as possible, but not everybody wants to pay the setup costs. And you really need to get your head around this before you start. Next slide. Okay, as a product designer and manufacturer of a variety of products, you'll probably think I'm gonna to talk to you about production techniques to enable you to scale up manufacture, but I'm not. The biggest issue that people have come to us with is that you must, and I repeat, you must know your market first. Simply put, if you do not know what your market wants, you will design and make the wrong product. A product that nobody wants, again, uh, you will be surprised that this is by far the biggest issue that companies will face and why most products eventually fail and disappear. Ah, <clears throat> That's not my problem, I already have a customer and uh, it's that customer that's driving me to scale up and reduce costs, you might say. But do you really know your customer? What do they want to do with their business? What's their plans, not just for this year, but for the next three years? Um, and if you have more than one customer, do they all have similar plans and requirements? Do they all want the same number of products and will they pay the same price? All this is vital information because how many products you are going to want to make this year, next year or in three years? And it's a, it's a big question this about planning for the future. Yes, so I understand that it's an almost impossible question to answer. But the more you know about your market, the better informed you will be about which technique or process 
you're going to use. Slide five, please. Again, you must remember the more the, uh, the products that you want to make, the bigger the setup costs you will face. And it's this dilemma that you will face. How much do you have to pay out before you even sell a product that will make the difference between success and failure, or most importantly, make a profit? The risk you will face is that let's say you're making 100 products a month at the moment and you want to ramp up to 1,000 products a month. That will be one cost. But what happens if your customer actually has plans to upscale to 10,000 products a month? That's a completely different production process. We have encountered many times companies having borrowed money to upscale only to find out after a year that they still cannot make enough product and they have to shell out again to upscale again. The problem is they have not paid um, for the first setup or scaling up costs in the first place. It was going to be amortised over three years to get a payback on investment. What do you do then? You didn't really know what your customer requirements were. The most important information you have to put together is what are the break-even points of three or four different production processes and how long will it be before the investment pays off? You might find that you can double production um, uh, on, a, on a different process as well as reduce costs by up to 15%. Uh, and it could be only 20% more that you have to pay for the setup costs. Break-even might be only having to sell an extra 30% of the product, but production will be far more flexible, cheaper and longer lasting. The biggest mistake companies make is to go for the cheapest option. Remember, if you get this wrong you can, and you cannot cope after only one year, you're gonna have to spend 20% more than you did originally. And there goes your profitability. All because you did not know your customer's growth requirements and you just went for the cheapest option. It's just cost you another 120% on top of your original costs. Now those numbers are only made up, but it illustrates the problem you will face. So then, and only then, once you have all the information can you, uh, that can make a deformed decision regarding which way to go. Know your market, break even points of each process. Slide six, please. Okay, so now on to technology and processes. Please, please, please do not go and see a manufacturer first. The factory that makes your product now may not have the facilities to ramp up to a two times, four times or 10 times production run. They will only try and sell you more of what you can do and not direct you towards what you should do. So you have the marketing project projections and you have evaluated what process you want to go for to give you the cost flexibility and return on investment. You now, and only now, are in a position to design something. Okay, so here now are the next biggest mistakes companies make. I've already designed the product. I've been making it for the last 10 years. I know how it works. Really? You've been making something in a particular way for many years. Let's say it's a vac forming. And you think, right, we want to convert to injection molding now. Okay, which kind of injection molding? On what machine and with what materials? Every technique requires different production requirements and the same can go for different materials. They all require a slight but significant design difference to make them work in a reliable and repeatable way in production. It might sound a bit like a sales pitch, but it's genuine advice based on uh, practicing product design for uh, nearly 40 years now. Um, and it will not be anything like 
you thought it had been done in the past. I've never been involved in a project where the end result was how we anticipated um, the thing was going to be right at the beginning of the project. So slide seven, please. So in conclusion, do know your market. Do assess each process and find the break even points. Do get a designer to design the product in the right way. Do not think that you know what your customer wants. Do not go and see a manufacturer before seeing a designer and assessing different processes. Do not think you already know the answers and how are you going to do it. Um, every project I've ever been involved in has always turned out different at the end compared to what people thought it was going to be like at the beginning. So thanks very much for listening to me. I hope I've given you something that uh, to think about before you commit to any significant expansion or scale up processes. This should be about doing it the right way, making money and secure your company's future. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Many thanks, Mick. Thank you uh, for that. And you'll have an opportunity to uh, answer some questions later on. I can see that there are some questions coming through the Q&A, which is great. I'm also still seeing there are some questions still coming through the chat box. If I can ask you again, please, please do put them through the Q&A. If they go into chat, they almost certainly will not be answered because um, we will miss them. I've also noticed there's been a number of questions around uh, availability and circulation of the slides uh, from today's presentations. We will not be circulating the slides individually as a slide deck, but a recording of the entire meeting will be available uh, to you um, after that, which of course will contain uh, the presentations. So, okay, thank you then to Mick. Uh, we're now going to move on to our second speaker. So in the background, Adam, if I can get you to start to share your screen. So our second speaker is Adam Barnby, um, and he's going to give us an innovative perspective uh, and discuss moving from prototype to medium volume. Over to you, Adam. Thank you. Hang on a minute. There you go. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Adam Barnby. I uh, own and run two companies for my sins. Um, Band is a uh, is a composites prototype and development company, and Eve is a uh, is an R and D. It was an R and D project within Band that grew out of it and became its own company. Um, I'm going to start by talking about Eve because it's a uh, it's it's it sort of shows some relevance to this conversation because it's it's sort of gone through all of the ring rules of getting from uh, prototype or concept through to prototype through to low volume manufacturing, um, and uh, I want to talk a little bit about the pain that I've experienced and um, where we've got to at the end of it. So, oh, it's not doing it. So Eve was um, born to bridge the gap between uh, a van and a, uh, a cargo bike. Um, but to try and bring all the positives of both of these entities into one, into one thing, we wanted to create something that was massively um, efficient, something that was truly zero emission, and I'll come back to that in a minute, uh, something that op uh, reduced operating costs, and, uh, but still had that user appeal of, of a van. You know, not, not many people want to jump on a, on a bike all day and um, you know, go around and make deliveries, getting wet and um, you know, being mowed down by, by cars and things. So what we wanted to do was really sort of try and bridge that gap, um, take the sort of the aesthetics of a, of a, of a small vehicle, um, but marry that with the, uh, the usability of, of an e-cargo bike and what they actually give you from an efficiency uh, increase point of view. Um, Coming back to the true zero emissions uh, point, you know there are there are electric vehicles out there. Um, I'm, I'm a big fan of electrification, but I'm also a big fan in sort of um, fit for purpose. You know, the, within a city centre, most average speeds are well under 10 mile an hour, um, and on a bike of this nature, an e-bike, you can you can legally go to 15 and a half miles an hour. So we thought we would try and fit within these parameters, and uh, we tried to design a product that. That could again, you know, bridge the two gaps, but still have a, a very sort of um, uh, easy selling point to uh, to large major blue chip companies. 
We started off by um, trying to create a, a very, very simple steel chassis, relatively low setup costs, a very simple jig bench. Um, and we wanted to sort of reduce the part counts as much as possible. Um, this, this PP1 chassis was the first vehicle that we actually produced. Um, and you'll sort of see where there's, there's, not much, there's not much moving parts going on there. Although, there, although it's a bit ugly, there's a there's sort of tube work going on, on all over the place. The, the main ethos behind this vehicle was that there were, no, there were the minimum amount of moving parts. Uh, and that's important for two reasons. First and foremost, our part count is less. Um, secondly, from, a, from an operator's point of view, there's less to go wrong. So most operators in the logistics industry, they do not want a maintenance cost. You know, you start telling them what the costs are to run these sorts of vehicles. You know, they want that cost to be reduced as far as possible. So we tried to design a chassis that, that had, you know, zero or, or as many, as little moving parts as possible. So the suspension is actually um, runs through the tube work and the, the suspension or the, or the road handling um, and the com road compliance comes through the, the manipulation of, of tube. So we tried to use a material that was, you know, at first and foremost, very simple, readily available off the shelf, um, but use it in a different way and not something that's not necessarily um, how you would normally build a chassis. You would build a chassis to be very rigid and then, um, you know, have, have moving parts coming off it. We wanted to design something that was actually flexible in the ways that we wanted it to be flexible. Um, and there's some, there's some specifications there of what we actually uh, created. To date, um, with that first initial vehicle, we decided to go and do some trials with it. You know, we didn't want to um, tool up for, for mass volume without actually getting it out there and, and sort of getting some decent partners on the go. So very early on, we, we partnered with DPD. Uh, we were very fortunate to, to land them as a, as a sort of technical partner and, and someone to hold our hands and tell us what they wanted. Um, if I was to go off and design this myself, it certainly wouldn't look anything like what it does right now. So coming back to what Mick was saying, you know, we, we really did listen to the customer because at the end of the day, they're the ones that are going to um, put their hands in the pocket and pay for these things. Um, we sort of branched out from, uh, from the UK, tried to get into the Scandinavian countries because they're, they're set up, ready to go um, and want to operate these vehicles you know, today. Um, so we started working with people like Post Nord and Post Norgay, who have been test riding these in, in places like Copenhagen and, and Oslo, uh, where the infrastructure is already set up and ready to receive this, this kind of e-cargo bike based vehicle. Um, we've been working with different councils, different postal services. Um, we've gone for, uh, we've patented uh, or we've got uh, application pending for our, uh, for our chassis design. Um, and we've run a couple of different awards uh, and created some vehicles that have, that have really kicked up a bit of a stir, like the, the Eve Cool, which is a, a, it's actually a 12 volt um, freezer vehicle. So it's, it's part of the cold chain um, logistics system. From here, we've moved on and we've learned everything, we've taken everything that we've learned from our current customers and gone back to the drawing board and quite literally redesigned the entire vehicle. Um, what we wanted to do is, is, is get to the point where we had a chassis that could produce multiple different mod model variants. So we went back in history and just looked at, you know, what, what's, what, is other, what have other people done? Uh, and the Ford Transit van as a, as a, a chassis cab platform really gave us that, that bit of a sort of um, eureka moment to say, well, it actually doesn't need to be anywhere near as complex as, as how we've made it. Let's make it super simple. Um, and then go even further, you know, how do we ship these across the, the seas? How do we get them into different uh, international locations? So um, we've designed it so that it's almost a flat packable item as well now. Um, and the rear cargo box can be manipulated and, and, and it's completely modular and, and changed to uh, each customer's requirements. Um, the chassis from, from the first point was relatively complex to make. It was quite difficult to uh, manipulate within a welding jig. We took all that knowledge and, and basically put it into, into this new chassis, the new revised chassis. Um, we tried to make it much simpler uh, from a point of view of welding, from a point of view of assembly, because we understood just how many hours had gone into the first chassis that um, you know, increases your costs all the time. You, you're constantly looking at, at ways in which you can reduce costs. You have to really look inside and be quite brutal in your, in your design and engineering changes. Um, so with this, we've got uh, different assemblies for the seats, different assemblies for the steering column, different assemblies for the rear uh, transmission. And it means that all of those parts can be made um, at different um, uh, build stations and be brought to the vehicle uh, at the end of the production line. 
Um, it also means that we can then develop. So it might be that the chassis stays the same, but we have a different seating position or we have a different steering position. Um, all of these means that we haven't, we haven't had to pay out again for another tool, another bit of design work. Um, it just means that we've got a platform there that we can, we can grow up from. And uh, it's a relatively low cost to actually get to a point where we've, we've got something that's quite substantial and, and very usable and something that can create multiple different vehicle models. From that, we've got um, maybe four different types. We've obviously got a, a standard sort of chassis platform. We built everything around a Euro pallet because that is what every customer feedback um, came to us with, with, you know, everything needs to fit around a Euro pallet. And even if it's not a Euro pallet, most of the boxes that logistic companies use, is, use are, are based around the sort of 300, 600, 900 millimeter dimensions. So um, the, the, the different models that we've got are everything from a fixed box right the way down to a roll on roll off cab. And actually by getting, getting to this point, we found ourselves in a position with, with um, postal service companies where we're actually now designing the, the, the new logistics format for them whereby we've come up with a little bit of an idea and actually that idea is then rolled out into how they operate. So it's not just about the, um, the design of the vehicle and how you can make it. It's also about how you can integrate your product into um, how a current customer is operating. Um, we, we, we've, we've learned a hell of a lot uh, over the past year uh, and really tried to sort of change the way in which we think and get inside the customer's brain so that we can feed back into the design and make something that they actually want to buy. From, from there, we've sort of gone into, uh, onto the bodywork side of things. And, and my other company, BAMD, as I said, is a, is a composites company. We produce parts for people like Aston Martin. Uh, currently, we're building the Volta electric truck that you see at the bottom right-hand side of the corner. And obviously, we've got Eve. Um, what we wanted to do as BAMD is create a, a process that uh, was, was sort of highly driven towards um, uh, sort of sustainable environmental recycled materials. Um, which sounds pretty boring, but actually for me, it's quite a, it's quite a uh, poignant thing because um, the C19 pandemic sort of, it, it ends up uh, ringing true with, with how we operate. You know, it's not, it's not okay that we import so much stuff. Um, we should be looking at home growing materials as well as home growing products. And um, some of the materials that we actually use in our bike are literally grown within the UK, farmed and then uh, woven in the UK, brought to us uh, as a dry fiber material. We have it pre-pregged into, uh, into a usable composite. And then, uh, yeah, we, we can almost say that we've got a fully sustainable bodywork um, system for our vehicle, which, which for me is a good selling point, but also from, a, from an ethical point of view, we're, we're a very sort of um, responsible manufacturer, which I think it, it, it matters now, but it's, I think it's gonna matter even more over the next coming, coming years. How does the process work? Well, we're going to get onto tooling in a minute, but um, you know the, the process is pretty simple. We design a product, we design a tool, uh, we use a recycled um, tooling block that, that goes to one of our machining partners, in this case, Freeform. All of their waste machining goes back to the tooling block manufacturer again, and that, that tooling cycle can be um, constantly recycled. Um, we then use things like water-based solvents and sealers. Uh, we use a bio-based um, tooling material. Um, we work with a company called Bcomp, who are the flax weavers. So they, they actually produce the, uh, uh, the majority of our flax for us. And then we've got two, two low volume and me medium volume processes for the actual parts manufacturer. So um, we use a prepreg um, autoclave process at the moment to produce our body panels, but that is expensive. Um, it's the quickest route to market at the moment because it's what's available. Um, but the tooling that we actually produce is capable of doing not only the prototyping and low volume tooling, it's also capable of doing the medium volume tooling because it's, um, it's high temperature proof. So we can go from uh, maybe a three to four hour process to produce a part down to like a 45 minute process to, reduce, to produce a, a body panel. Um, that for me is where I'm currently at in our development because I've got to start producing at least 100 units a month. And at the moment we're producing maybe two units a day uh, at best. So, and it's expensive. So I've, I've had to sort of really brutally look at how we manufacture, brutally look at how we design the parts, go back to the drawing board and um, think of a different way of using our, our, our materials, but in a, in, a more rapid, uh, in a more rapid route to manufacture. And then at the end, we've got a, a, a trimming and finishing um, solution where we actually work with a company called Cyberweld 
and they have a uh, recycle or they, they reuse robotic welding systems um, we put routing heads on them and, and they trim our parts for us again it's part of the process it's, it's relatively um, labor intensive so if we can get a robot to do it that's uh, it's much better for our cost um, just to bring on to sort of the, the reason why we've gone around the, the, the route we've taken um, and how we're comparing our product to the current market out there. The only real box you need to look there is the total cost per day, which is spread out over five years. You know, our, our vehicle costs on average about nine pounds per day over five years. Um, if you look at a standard sort of diesel van, it's about 46 pounds a day. Um, this is a real good selling tool for us, but, but it kind of goes back to that design point. Everything that we've done has got to this point and everything comes down to a cost and the customer is really only interested in you um, showing them how you're going to save them money operationally or save them time operationally. And, and we're trying to do, we're trying to do both. So um, yeah, relatively, relatively clear. In summary, um, we've obviously touched on design. Um, my my main focus is on is on the design and, and the prototyping prototyping phases. I think if you can do more thinking at this point, again going back to what Mick said, um, if you're if you're working with designers who really understand their materials most importantly and their and their processes, you're going to save a hell of a lot of money in the uh, in the later pre-production stages of your of your product development. Um, once you've sort of obviously produced prototypes, you, you've just got to listen to your customers. And the feedback that you get from them will be better than anything you'll be able to uh, produce yourself. Um, and again, being brutal, feeding back into your into your development and your design for manufacture, you really got to um, uh, you really got to take that constructive criticism from your customers, and uh, and and re-engineer wherever necessary. I think it's also important to get strategic partners in place. Um, we did with uh, with Eve, although DPD aren't necessarily um, strategic from a point of view in engineering. They've been fantastic from a feedback point of view. They, they, they don't hold back and, and we've been able to uh, rapidly develop our vehicle to a customer that wants to buy it. Um, and then lastly, just on tooling, going back to the, the, the largest costs are the setup costs. The tooling costs are so important. And, and what I really wanted to do in the process that we created with the steer process is from a design point of view, we've designed some tooling that is not, not only good for prototyping, pre-production, this low volume sector, um, the tooling is also then good to go into medium volume. You know, thousand offs per year out of the same tool um, is where I'm personally going to save my my largest costs. Um, so that's 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 me. Um, very open to receiving any questions. If you'd like to know a bit a little bit more about Eve or Band, um, I've, I've felt a lot of pain over the past uh, year and a half trying to develop a product from from nothing and um, yeah, there's, there's there's a lot of knowledge there that I I'm very interested in sharing. So. Any questions? Really appreciate it. Thanks very much for your time. Brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Um, and uh, I'm pleased to see there are a huge number of questions coming through the Q&A, which is great. And in fact, Mick is already firing out uh, various different answers to that already, which is also great to see. We'll maybe revisit some of those um, during the Q&A just for the, the benefit of the kind of broader audience. But um, we will now move on to our third speaker. I see John's already got himself set up, which is great. So I'll just pass straight on to you, John. Danny, thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you to my colleagues uh, who speak before me. Uh, my name is John Toll. I am the Business Development Director for Tharsis. Um, to take you through, I guess, the coal face from a manufacturer's perspective uh, and giving you some tips along the way there, what the real journey from your, your prototype product all the way through to a volume manufactured product is. Um, this is my first webinar, by the way, so if I look a bit nervous, um, please excuse me. This is a new experience, uh, rather than standing on stage and jumping around, which I tend to do. Um, so what we're about, um, we're a Northeast-based organization, and we have three factories there. We have a fabricate, metal fabrication plant, and we have an assembly plant for what we call strategic machines. And I'll take you through some of our customers in a minute, just to give you a flavor rather than showing off in terms of what we actually make for people. Um, to um, Mick's point early on, we really look at the business outcomes from our customers. So one of the things that we spend a lot of time on is understand that business case before we embark upon a new project with a customer, um, because that enables us to help them get to the price point for the machine. The two are inextricably linked in terms of where you need to think about design and what you're going to design for your market. Um, well, revenue about 60 million this year, um, and I'm pleased to say we're surviving the um, 
current crisis pretty well. We've, uh, we are continuing to make machines um, and are doing pretty well. Um, just to give you flavour, kind of the breadth of the organisations we deal with, you'll see people there from DHL through to a number of startups that we deal with, um, small robots, a project we're currently working on. Um, Automata, we've been through this process of the prototype all the way through to um, manufactured product over the last 18 months now. And Orbs, a new product we're working on. Right through to Ocado, who we're really famous for, so we'll make around about four to 5,000 bots for Ocado this year to go to their customer fulfillment centers. And they've been a, a partner of ours for, I think we met in 2011. So actually there's an interesting point if you want to understand this journey. We only started manufacturing with them in volume in 2017. So it's kind of a five, five year process to get that machine into full, full scale production, much longer than people expect. So this is a, a fairly typical journey we go through. Um, and that's, um, probably an optimistic time scale, but it's where some people like to get to. So if you came to me today, and we typically be at you know, like Small Robot um, and other organizations, will come to us with a prototype machine. Um, we'll sit down with them and understand what that, that machine has to do. What's the, what's the milestones for success? And I'll go to talk about, about CE testing a little bit more in a minute, because that's something that's really come to highlight on a project that's not named here that we're working on currently. We'll then typically take your machine through, or your product through a, what we call a pre-pilot or an engineering build. So we have the capability to take what you have today and look at some very raft SOPs and bill of materials and put some units together for you. Typically you may want this for field trials or initial trials with customers, but it's a very hands-on process. During that journey, we'll start to look at the supply chain with you in terms of optimizing it and what that supply chain should look like, how we use our buying power to leverage better prices for you on your product. And once you've done your, your prototype build, you've done some customer testing, um, you're probably a year later going to come back and do some pilot build. Pilot for us is where we really start to manufacture the product in earnest. Um, taking design, smartening up the, cell, the, um, the build process, the build of material, formalizing how we're going to make it with you. And it's a very collaborative process to make sure we get to a point you know, six months later where we know how to build this thing effectively. Um, and this is one point where I'll actually disagree with, with, with Nick earlier on. Do come and talk to us early because often we find during this part of the process, people have designed a product which isn't manufacturable um, or could have been designed much better earlier on to make that build process more cost effective. But this is during pilot, this is where we're optimizing this. And you may go back and do some redesign at that point to ensure that you get to, to a good price point and a good buildable, reliable machine. Then Nirvana comes, you've, you've taken some, some product to market, um, customers are paying for it, and we then take you through to volume manufacturing, which is a completely different team. First bit, very much engineering led, lots of um, design guys in there, then through to the floor where we have plenty of white space and you'll go to what you'd normally see, expect to see from a, a production floor. Um, just gonna share with you um, what, what this is actually a live proposal we're working on at the moment um, for an organization. So we're looking here, phase one, is we're going to take a couple of um, units and shadow build them with you. Um, actually at your premises, we'll send our engineers down for a couple of days, we'll have a long as it takes to see how we build it. We'll then come back and say we'll do that engineering build with you. And then supply chain shut up, pilot build through to volume manufacturing. So that, that's a real live example we're working on today. You know, name's been taken off it. Um, but that'll give you some idea of the, the, the journey we're going through. Um, a word on certification. Um, this is, certification is an expensive process. CE certifying something can take a bit of anything from 10,000 to 50,000. Um, we were looking at this particular project where they needed to go outside. It's an outdoor robot. The jigs and fixtures alone to go through vibration testing are going to cost them 10,000 pounds. So a question again on this product journey, when do you need to certify? What level do you need to certify before you incur that sort of cost? And those are some of the areas to consider, say performance, the manufacturing, the reliability of the product, electrical safety is normally the one that people consider first, um, and EMC and environmental are probably the two 
but do really discuss with your manufacturing partner when you need to do what bits for certification. So this thing we've now agreed is actually they won't, they'll do a minimal level of certification this year because they would need to do some field trials. And when version two comes along, we'll go through the field certification with them later on. Um, and just to give you some idea then as to how you'd be expected to pay for this, because um, we, we, we do like to charge our customers what we do. Um, during the um, engineering build process, and so my title is wrong there for some reason, it's not MPI, during the early part of the process, um, you get charged engineering day rates. You do it on a day rate basis, very flexibly, very collaboratively, effectively pay, pay for what you use at that stage. MPI is pilot you'll need to expect, um, again, as, as Mick has alluded to there, cell setup costs, tooling costs, uh, supply chain setup costs, um, the documentation, um, how we're gonna test it, what jigs and fixtures we need to test the machine. And then finally, the model, when you go to volume man manufacturing, flicks to quite a different model, um, which is more run rate, we're looking at unit cost, we're looking at then amortizing warehousing, manufacturing, cell space across the cost of the product. Um, we, you'll hear something called bomb and curd, which is about um, supply chain costs, um, inspection costs, obsolescence, scrappage costs. So your models change as you go through the process. Um, and finally, um, to kind of again set expectations for people, the starter's journey is expensive and uh, really do take advice there as to what a realistic cost for your early units going to be. This is the model we use towards the right hand of that. It's called um, Sustainability Maturity Index. So if you don't get to volume manufacturing, so when you're, when you're talking about thousands, 10,000s a year, um, your product has to be 98% stable. It can't be subject to continuous engineering change notes. The process to make it has to be 98% consistent as well. And you have to be able to predict volume back to your manufacturer within a plus or minus 30% range to again, to allow us to get the right level of effective costing um, from our supply chain. Um, Alec, that's it from me. I'm super happy to take questions, um, conscious that we've probably overrun as we do to do. Um, thank you very much. Many thanks, John, and to our other two speakers, to Mick and Adam as well, um, for those presentations. So we will now move on to a more formal um, uh, Q&A part of, of today's uh, proceedings. Um, there have been a number coming through on the um, through the Q&A slot, which is excellent. That's good to see. Um, I'm going to start with a, one for you, John, because John, I know you need to leave uh, in, in, a, in a few a few minutes. So I'll, I'll maybe bring a couple your way immediately. Yeah. Uh, sure. um, before before you need to um, to head off, one of them I think you, you you covered a little bit when you were speaking, but but maybe it's worth just kind of reiterating again. The question that was asked is: At what stage in the R&D process do you suggest? that you or people such as yourself come in to support customers? Uh, we're really happy to come in early and we, we call it um, a critical friend. So just looking at what you're designing, making, inventing and say, well, just think about making it this way. Um, so early on, we're really happy to just have those discussions, you know, these days over Teams or Skype or whatever it is. Uh, and by the way, we've had some really effective methods for um, keeping deals moving. Um, but yeah, early. Okay, Doc. And, and, and while while you're while you're unmuted there, I guess, and this is, um, there's a kind of um, a practical question here. Um, I presume that you've signed customer NDAs as part of that process. And how would you manage an issue where a customer might bring you a design that you're producing or, or producing something similar for someone else? Uh, well, absolutely, we operate under NDA. Um, we've experienced this recently in the agritech market. We're working on two um, robot tractors. Uh, we've said there that we will um, create a um, secure manufacturing environment for them, which is not accessible by anybody else. And also in this case, we will not do any design work for those two people. Um, unfortunately, you can't unsee something you've seen. So, uh, whereas often we'll help out with design work with these two circumstances, we won't actually do any design work for them. We'll just do the manufacturing. Okay, okay. thank you for that. Um, our next question, it was really aimed at all our panelists, but Adam, I'm going to give it to uh, uh, you since you were kind of coming from the, the innovation side. Um, do you think that the, the UK's innovation system or ecosystem, I guess, is set up to support the development of 
UK developed ideas? And if not, where do you think that, I guess, could be um, better supported? Sorry, Ali, is that to me? That was for Adam, sorry. All right. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, I think we've had a really frustrating time with our UK. Um, a lot of the time we find that most of the grants go to these sort of tech based app blockchain, um, you know, autonomous vehicle side of things when really those are those are those are usually um, problems that we're trying to solve maybe 10, 15 years in the future. Um, and unfortunately, ours is a very real solution right now. So it doesn't necessarily seem to get any form of um, doesn't tick any boxes with our UK. And uh, although they take a hell of a lot of time to, um, to write bids up and, and get, get through the system, we've actually had zero um, RUK confirmed uh, grants so far. Um, we've just missed out on one for the, the COVID-19 response where we, was, we were trying to um, produce a version of our vehicle, which was the roll on roll off version, um, where we could do a vehicle sharing platform um, to help places like restaurants and shops so they could share the vehicle in the day but have different boxes at night. Um, and uh, yeah, it was sort of uh, the application was unsuccessful. But uh, we were we were trying to help customers and, and um, businesses that have been um, sort of permanently disrupted by the COVID nineteen scenario. Um, which again, you know, we we st we're still doing that. It's just a case of the the the, the development is all internal and um, our own cost. Yeah. Mick, if I can put the next question um, in, in, in your direction. Um, the, the question was worded as such, should a product designer be able to advise on circular economy aspects uh, of the product in terms of demanufacture, reuse? Is that something that you would, you would advise on? Um, yeah, I think I've just answered that uh, by typing, but um, it's becoming much, much more important, the circular economy, uh, particularly as the bigger companies see that it's an advantage in their market <clears throat> so the big companies are going to start saying okay our product is recyclable we can take it back that filters down to the smaller companies i'm finding at the moment that it's actually the smaller companies that are, are pushing this much more but it, as the years go by this is going to become a, mu a much more important um, issue in the design process uh, and if I, if I can really quickly, um, just go back to what was just said about grants. Um, I'm actually a, um, an Innovate UK assessor. And um, ten, 10 years ago, the success rate for grant applications used to be about one in three, one in four. Um, at the moment, it's looking like one in 20. So if anybody's thinking of grants, and that's the way to move forwards. I'd say, forget it. You be sorting out your development some other way because it's it's getting impossible to get UK grants. We do not support innovators in this country like they do in other countries. Uh, and also, if I if I may quickly, um, regards to John, I said don't don't go and see a manufacturer. Whatever you do. Um, it's a bit of a generalisation. Uh, what I'm trying to say is um, you should let the designer go to the manufacturer. Let the designer talk to different manufacturers. Let the designer advise you which is the right manufacturer for the right process. Um, I'm not in any way trying to interrupt what John was saying because I actually agree with him. Um, but John can make a particular type of product, whereas perhaps somebody wants a different type of product. So you should let the designer get involved in all these things to try and identify who is the right person with the right process. So sorry, I answered three questions there. That's perfect. Efficiency, Mick. Um, and I, just to pick up a little bit on the, the circular economy part, just to point out that the week five of this series on the 13th of May, we'll be discussing that in much more depth, that may be something that you want to put in your diaries, let's say 13th of May. Clearly, we're being overwhelmed with questions, which is brilliant. We're not going to get through them all. We'll do as best as we can in the next three or four minutes before we begin to wrap up. There's been a few questions come in on IP. We're not going to answer them directly here. Again, week seven of this series is going to explore IP in much more detail. That's the 27th of May. So if that's something that is a concern to you, please put that one 
uh, also in your diary. Uh, coming back to you, you Adam, um, uh, quite a specific question. Um, somebody's asking if you could share a bit more information on the steer process, and is this an internal tool or something that's more widely used that people could access? So um, it's been it's something that we've been really developing now for probably about four or five years, but we've never advertised it or um, or shared any information on it. So I wanted to just build a real quick little brand around it so that we could start um, sharing it. So a lot of our a lot of the customers that are coming to us for composite parts, they they are actually asking us. Um, about the recyclability of materials, um, you know where they're, where they're sourced from, and it is um, coming back to what Mick, what Mick was saying. It is actually becoming quite a, a big tick in the box for SMEs as well as large um, blue chip companies to sort of shout about their green credentials. Um, so the steer process was 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 designed around trying to trying to create a sort of start to finish composite process to start with. Um, that, that is, you know, uh, not hypocritical in, it, in its conception because composites is a very, very dirty industry. Um, everything right the way down to, to, the, to the manufacturing of the raw components. So, um, yeah, I, 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 we're working really closely with a couple of um, uh, natural composite or natural fiber uh, manufacturers and we're developing and sort of um, innovating a, a new type of material which kind of uses two different processes um, but it's more it's mainly to do with how you process the part in in higher volume um, from from a from a turnaround point of view um, of time and a turnaround point of view of, uh, of the amount of money you're spending on your process okay thanks adam okay as you can see we're approaching five two now so we are kind of running out of time for questions clearly there are many many unanswered questions in the stream we will make sure where possible to get these questions in front of our panelists or ourselves within Product Design Scotland or the KTN and get uh, answers back to you in any way that we can. I'd like to thank you for, for submitting so many. It's great to have such uh, an engaged audience uh, and thank you again for participating. Big thanks also to our three speakers, to Mick, to Adam and to John. Many thanks for your insights and it just leaves me now to pass you back to Abby who will just do a final bit of wrap up before we can we finish this session. Yeah, thanks for that, guys. Thanks, speakers. Thanks, Ali. Some really interesting uh, questions there and really yeah, great presentations. And I just to, to mention the funding, we're going to cover that later in the series as well. So next week, we've got one on design processes and principles. We'll, again, we've got some great speakers talking about design for manufacture, design strategy. And then the next four events, um, we've got one on funding and investment. And, I, I, I get that, that there's sometimes frustration with funding at certain points in the journey, but there's also also an argument to say that actually there's a surplus of funding available in the UK and it is, there is an art to writing um, grant applications. Um, that's something that KTN can help with. They can help provide a little bit of guidance around that and help provide feedback on draft applications. So definitely get in touch with us if you're you're looking to submit an application to Innovate UK or other funders, or you're looking for, for private investment, we can help develop pitch decks. It is competitive, but there, there is lots of money out there. Um, yeah, the, the session on a circular economy, 13th of May as well, is one to look out for. Um, so these will all be um, published. The registration pages will be published um, on our website in the next few days. Yeah, hopefully you can join us at some of these events as well. And yeah, just, just to, to reiterate that everybody will be sent a meeting module link and um, a feedback form and access to the recording. So yeah, hopefully you can stay engaged in the, through the rest of the series. Thanks everyone.